Robin this morning.
shake a hand to the person near you and say good morning. everybody yeah good morning everybody you may have a seat thank you so much uh, man what what a way to start off the day t- talking about our God in such a beautiful uh, and powerful way uh, this is a we this is May can you believe that it's May already I mean yeah it's it's great it's uh it's like it May kicks in and it's like our schedules kick up a gear and um, I'm so grateful that you're here I know there's so many competing things that compete for your time so grateful that you choose to uh, be together. This is how we love Jesus. We gather together to love one another. And as we're together, we get to express our worship to him. And so we're grateful to do that together. We're gonna do some more singing in a little bit. Today, we've got communion. We're gonna finish our sermon today. As we start this brand new series, we're gonna finish with the time of communion. And we invite uh, you to participate. If you're new with us, we invite all of those who are wanting to follow Jesus or who are following Jesus to join us in uh, communion today. And then we're gonna end with the time of singing and uh, celebration uh, and and just a meaningful day ahead of us. Uh, We do have in May several things that I wanna let you know about. Now, and an important thing is uh, you have six days until Mother's Day. Actually, you have seven, but you have six days of shopping to get what you need to celebrate mom. And we hope that you uh, include us in your celebration of mom. No better way to celebrate mom than to come and let's uh, grow in our faith together because we are a church who wants to build strong families. We wanna build your family and we believe mom wants us to have a strong faith in Christ, right? See how I just tied all that in together, right? And so in this, uh, join us next Sunday. We're gonna have a special treat for mom. Also, we'll have a photo booth that you can get a pic with mom and make this a meaningful uh, time together and have a pic to remind yourself of how grateful you are uh, for the, your family. So next week is Mother's Day. Also next week, we're not just wanting to celebrate our moms. We want to also come and we want to come alongside mothers in our community who are maybe in, a, in needing of help. And so we have partnered with Sparrow Women Clinic and we are doing a diaper drive next Sunday. So if you can go to the store this week, when you buy your card for mom, buy uh, you know your stuff that you're gonna make mom for a meal, uh, for those of you that do that, um, get some diapers, get some wipes or maybe a bottle and bring those items to, uh, to church with you next Sunday, to the service next week. And we're gonna have a pack and play in the lobby, put it in there. And we wanna help bless uh, mothers in need, mothers to be or mothers in need uh, who are to be or who are already in, uh, ch- with the child. Um, we want to bless them. And so bring diapers, wipes and bottles uh, next Sunday when you come. Also, uh, we're going to do something to serve the food insecure in our Leavenworth County. Uh, Leavenworth County is one of the largest counties that suffer from food insecurity in Kansas. And we want to help uh, come alongside other churches that are doing this and other organizations that are doing this. And on May 25th, you have an opportunity to step in and serve a meal um, to those who, um, who suffer from food insecurity. So you can help us prepare that and uh, serve that on May 25th. You can sign up to be involved in that on our app or through our website. Um, today is a special day because today is, um, uh, uh, we, we honor our military families who are leaving and we call it Sending Sunday. And for those of you that are military uh, or you're active duty, maybe you're not PCSing or in your staying, uh, this is for all of our active duty family din- uh, families. Tonight we're having dinner for you. And if you have not signed up and you are available and you'd like to come and be a part of tonight, uh, we would love to serve you dinner. It's not too late to, to RSVP. You can do that on your app or on the website. And today is meaningful because today uh, we want to specially uh, acknowledge those who are PCSing. Uh, Military families are a big strategic part of our vision as a church family. We we want you to know that. And if you're military, we see you as a big part of what God is doing in the kingdom. 
And uh, you're part of our vision because we want to influence 10,000 people around the world who are living out an expression of loving Jesus, becoming like Jesus and sharing Jesus. This is part of the the vision God's given us. By the end of 2030, we will have influenced 10,000 people and you're a strategic part because as you come here, God sends you wherever you go. And we want you to live on this mission with us because this is God's mission for us to love Jesus, become like Jesus and share Jesus. And so if you are an active duty military family and you are PCSing or in our civilian terms, you are moving, would you do me a favor? Would you stand with you and your family stand today? If you are PCSing, I know, have courage. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Stay standing. Yeah. Stay standing. We want to thank you, and right now they're coming by with a little token of our appreciation for you. And please stay standing in this whole time. I know it's going to be awkward, but we thank you um, for how you've served our country. For those of you that are the active duty personnel, thank you for how you served our country and the sacrifices you make. To the spouses, thank you for the sacrifices each of you make because your sacrifice is great. Uh, Thank you to the kids and to the family for the sacrifices you've made. We are so grateful for how you have served our country. Thank you for being involved in our church family. Thank you for many of you. Many of you serve in different capacities and you've been involved in different capacities in our church and our community. And that we are grateful. And, uh, and today in this gift, this is something that you can keep. And I, I just wanna tell you a little story. Yeah, uh, Friday, I got to have a coffee with one of our military families who has said, hey, I'm a military, we're a military on mission. They've been here with Westside twice in their, uh, in their military journey. He was back for a command course and I got to have coffee with him. And he goes, I want you to see something. And he pulled out the coin that we've given you. And he says, whenever I travel, I take this with me because I'm reminded that wherever I go, I'm sent. And I want, that's our desire for each and every one of you. We want you to realize that wherever you go, you are sent and we're there to support you. And right now I'm gonna ask all of our church family, you see where everybody's at. I'm gonna ask us to stand in support of them and the others who may be moving and PCSing. I'm gonna ask you to reach out your hand and I want us to pray for them. Will you do this with me? Father, we're so thankful for these families. We're thankful for the men and women who serve and sacrifice. We're thankful for the spouses who sacrifice and the children, the parents, the brothers, and all the family, the friends that sacrifice. And Father, we thank you that wherever they go, you are with them. And we thank you that we can trust you that wherever they go, your peace will be with them. And we ask you that your protection be upon them. We ask that your provision be with them. And Father, we ask that as they go, wherever they go, as they go, may they feel that their faith has been established, that no matter what they go into, their faith remains unshakable and they can remain unshakable. And Father, we ask you that as they go to these new uh, locations, these new bases, some maybe even new countries, Father, that you put them in positions to where they can be your light and be your salt and expand your kingdom as they are loving you, becoming like you, and sharing you. Father, we trust every one of these families into your care. And it's in Jesus' name that we send them. Amen. Hey, will you give them one more round of applause and thank you. You may all be seated. Forgive. Just seeing that word maybe does something to us. 
Why is it so hard to forgive? Why is it easy to forgive one person, yet so hard to forgive someone else? And why is it that we just choose not to forgive? Why don't we forgive others? Is it to have some sense of control? Is this the reason we withhold forgiveness? Is it because we wanna have control when someone has um, had control and abused their control over us? Is it so we can have a sense of power and so we are to have power in a situation where someone has abused their power over us? Is this our way of getting even? We withhold forgiveness and so therefore we withhold forgiveness. This is how we're gonna get even. This is how, this is what we can do to, to make sure we're even. Is it because they haven't experienced the pain you've experienced? Is that why we hold, withhold forgiveness? It's because they haven't uh, lost what they've, we've lost and they've not experienced the suffering from that? Is it because they haven't experienced just the suffering to the extent you've experienced the suffering? You know, what's interesting about forgiveness is that forgiveness is directly connected to justice. It's directly connected to justice. The measure of forgiveness that you give is directly connected, is equal to the measure of justice you feel has been granted and served. And we don't forgive because honestly, we don't believe justice has been served. Like the measure of justice that we want in the situation hasn't been satisfied, so we therefore can't forgive someone. And this is personal, isn't it? I mean, this is, this is private. This is, this is, in fact, some of you are already saying, Casey, I don't, I don't wanna go there today. I mean, this, just don't, and maybe your stomach's already turning just in talking about this because this hits each of us differently, and, but it hits all of us directly at the core of who we are. And this penetrates into the places of our lives where we've been hurt, where we're hurting, in fact, this may be that stomach turning is something, a reminder that you're still hurting from the pain. And it hits places maybe no one sees or maybe even no one even knows about. And for some, we need to recognize justice in what you feel like justice has not been served on the injustices or injustice committed against you. And maybe, maybe you don't just want justice. Maybe you want more than justice. Maybe... You want vengeance. You want them to suffer more than how you've suffered. And that feeling's real. Oh, that feeling's real. And it may, that may be the feeling that keeps you awake at night. It may be this, this feeling that keeps the, the thoughts rolling and you can't just shut them off. And, and this is emotional. This is personal. And you know what? Ultimately, this is spiritual. And until we understand the justice of God, we will not experience the gracious freedom to forgive. We desperately desire justice. This is something that's all of, that, that's in all of us and, and, and ingrained in all of us. And we desire this so much. So, and because we desire justice so deeply and so like this is, a, this is something we desire, we must seek to understand the justice of God. And until we have a concept of God's measure of justice on sin, we won't understand the gift that sal of salvation that has been given to each of us. And until we do that without understanding God's justice, we really won't understand how good the gospel of Jesus is for us and for the world. And we won't trust in it. We won't trust in God's measure of justice on sin. Until we understand it, we can't trust it. And without trusting in God's measure of justice on sin, we won't see how priceless forgiveness is to us. And we won't see that granting forgiveness is the defining evidence of salvation. And we're gonna talk more about that today 
in the next couple of weeks. My name is Casey, and it is such a privilege and an honor to be together with you. I'm always grateful for the time we get to share together. For those of you who are watching online, we're so grateful to be together with you wherever you are. If you're new with us online, or if you're new with us in the room, I want you to know we have a gift for you. If you're in the room and you're new with us, we'd love to give you that gift after we dismiss service today. And so if you're in the room after service, make your way through our lobby, into our welcome center, right across the lobby. There a host will be there, and that host would love to give you a gift for being with us today. If you're new with us online, they're posting a link to a connect card. Click that link, fill out that form, and we'd love to send you a gift for being with us today. Now, Westside, would you help me welcome everyone online and let those new within the room know how grateful we are? Yeah. Yeah, so great. Forgiveness. It's something we all need. It's something we all need. We can recognize that, right? And it's something we all need from God. And it's something we all need from each other. We all need forgiveness. And, and this is where the tension in forgiveness lies, right here, okay? The tension lies, see, forgiveness is hard. It's difficult and for some it's impossible. It is difficult to give forgiveness without justice. It's hard to forgive without justice. It's hard to forgive when you desire more justice to be served. And that's what's difficult to understand. See, forgiveness is directly connected to justice. And I hope in this series that for many of us, that this series helps you see forgiveness in a brand new way. I hope that you see your forgiveness in, that God has given you in a brand new way. And I hope and I pray that God's truth penetrates all of our hearts and brings all of us, every one of us, a freedom that we need to experience to forgive others. That's what I'm hoping and praying this series does. And as I mentioned earlier, until we understand that the justice of God and the full justice of God, until you understand the full justice of God, you will not experience the gracious freedom to forgive because it is a freedom that God wants all of us to experience and to walk in. See, God has revealed himself to humanity. And the reason God's revealed himself to all of humanity is because God wants to have a relationship with us. God then thus chose to reveal himself through this nation of Israel, this, this, that God took a man, turned him into a nation. God chose to reveal himself through the nation of Israel. Ultimately, God would be revealed through Jesus, through the lineage of the Jewish people. All this God chose to do so he could reveal himself to humanity, so humanity could have a relationship with him. So God chose then to reveal himself to an insecure man, who was a murderer. Not the person you and I would think in our book, God would re choose to re reveal himself, right? Like when we think of the leader of a nation, this guy is not gonna be the one. He couldn't speak well, he was insecure. He wanted everybody else to do it. And he had a record. He murdered somebody. So God chooses to reveal himself to Moses. And I want you to hear how God chooses to reveal himself to Moses, thus revealing himself to the nation of Israel. And because this is preserved in scripture and God chose to inspire men to, to write this down and collect this for thousands of years, men and women have preserved these scriptures. God reveals himself to you and I this way. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. Could you imagine being a murderer and hearing these words? A compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. 
Maybe you've read this passage before. Maybe you've never heard this passage in your life. But this is how God himself with his words describes who he is to humanity. And each of us connect with different words. Maybe different words stood out to you. Maybe that God is compassionate and gracious took out, stood out to you. Maybe that he's patient or he's slow to anger. That's another way to say patient. He's slow to anger. He abounds in love and faithfulness. These are all qualities and characteristics of God that he remains faithful to. He forgives those who are guilty. He forgives the guilty of their wickedness. He forgives the guilty of their rebellion and sin. And he also punishes the guilty. And maybe you see God and, and because the way you see God, you've grabbed onto certain traits about this and you hold on to those traits. Maybe you see God and the way you see God is he's a punisher. He's like this correctional officer in the sky waiting for you to break his law so he can punish you. And you think everything that's happened to you in this life, all the bad things that have happened to you in this, in this life are because of the things that you've done wrong and he's just getting back at you. Because you, you connect with him. Okay, I see that he punishes him. He's punishing me. Maybe you feel like God is punishing you because you're, of your, what your parents did or your grandparents did. That really resonates with you. And maybe you... Or maybe you connect with the, the, the beautiful descriptions of how God is loving, compassionate, gracious, faithful to this. And because you see God being compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love, maybe you don't see how God could punish people. How could this version of God deliver punishment to those he loves? How could God judge humanity in harsh ways, how, would, how could a good God allow suffering to come if he's loving, faithful, compassionate? How could he allow pain to come into our lives? Because that's the, way, the only way you see God, that you question how could that kind of God allow any of these? And, and, and why doesn't God do anything about the suffering and the pain that we all face? Now, in this passage, I want you to see some. This passage helps us understand God, and it helps us understand how forgiveness and justice are connected. And here is how I want you to see this. First, God's love is expressed through forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Can you imagine Moses and his story, how it felt to him to know that God is compassionate and gracious and he does forgive? all of his wickedness, his rebellion, and his very own sin. See, it takes love to forgive. It takes love for someone to forgive someone. You cannot forgive someone without a measure of love. If God did not love us, he would not forgive us. But we must not forget something about love. Love also means that consequences must be served and must come. And the reality is, is every one of us died. Right, And we know that the consequence of sin is death. And we all know that our physical bodies will die. So consequences still come. You can still love somebody. You can still love your child. And because you love your child, you discipline your child. And they have to suffer a consequence because we love them. And many think that God's love and his anger are two separate things. And we read this and we don't understand how they reconcile. Many think that the God of the Old Testament is this God of anger and wrath and the God, that the God of the New Testament is a different God who's all about love and compassion. But the reality is God's love and his anger are two sides of the same coin. See, consequences, yes, they must come. But this is where love leads to justice. God's justice is expressed through rightly punishing all who are guilty of sin. And this is where the tension is, isn't it? This is where the friction in life comes. How can forgiveness be granted when justice isn't served? How can we forgive and have justice served? What about the penalty that needs to be paid back? What about the debt that now is owed and needs to be re restored? What about the restitution that needs to be made? But what about the restoration that needs to come because all the things that have been destroyed in the wake of someone's sin against us? 
And does forgiveness mean that sin then goes unpunished? No. And here in this passage and throughout all of Scripture, mind you, we see something. God does not mercifully forgive without justly punishing sin. We first see this in the Genesis narrative. When Adam and Eve sinned, they ate, they disobeyed God, ate what they were not supposed to eat, not trusting in God's command, and they did not trust that the consequence would come on them, that death would come upon them. When they sinned, their and all of humanity's relationship with God was eternally broken. God wanted to restore that relationship with humanity. So God makes the first move toward humanity. God, he, he has, in order to do this, then he has to serve justice on sin by rightly serving a punishment for Adam and serving punishment for Adam and Eve's sin. He has to serve it. And that punishment was death. And when you, because when we die, when we, uh, disobey, we will surely die. That's what Jesus, uh, God said to Adam and Eve. And when Adam and Eve sinned, God mercifully and justly worked together. His mercy and his justice worked simultaneously. God mercifully allowed the punishment of death to justly come onto an animal. God punished sin so he could mercifully forgive. God made the first substitute payment for death through sacrificing an animal that became a covering for Adam and Eve's sin. He covered them with an animal skin. See, God would use a temporary solution of substituting an animal for the penalty of humanity's sin so humanity could be in relationship with God. And when God would lead Moses in this nation of Israel, God would give Moses a Levitical law that had this sacrificial law in it. And this sacrificial law would become a substitute. See, through this Levitical law, God allowed an animal to be substituted to bear God's judgment for a person's sin. The animal would be served a death penalty on the sinner's behalf. And the animal's death would cover the payment for the sin. In Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, the, the law states, for the life of the creature is in the blood and I have given it to you. So God has said, he, I've given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Thus the blood of the life of the animal would be the payment for one's sin. And through that, God would mercifully forgive by allowing punishment for sin to fall on the animal. The animal became a substitute. This was temporary, not a sustainable solution. In fact, we ought to be very grateful that God recognized this not as a sustainable solution because then every time we'd sin, every time we, we commit a new sin, we'd have to find another animal that would be pure and, and match, the, match the stipulations to be sacrificed on behalf of us to become a substitute for our wrong. And that solution was only a placeholder until God would reveal his love and justice in the most powerful way, in the way that would become good news for you and I and the world. See, through Jesus Christ's death, God allowed the Jesus to be substituted to receive God's judgment for all sin. God stepped into our place and Jesus would take the just punishment for every sin from every human being for all of time. God himself stepped in to take the death blow we deserved. Let that sink in. God substituted himself for all of humanity, including me and you. God, the most righteous being and most powerful being, stepped in and took the punishment that we all deserve. This was God's righteous act of justice on all sin. God substituted himself for us all. This is how God would ultimately judge sin. This is how God would also ultimately reveal his mercy to us. This is how God served justice through his most righteous act of love. God made the first sacrifice to cover 
Adam and Eve sins, and God made the final sacrifice, the last sacrifice that would ever be made and needed to be made through Jesus' suffering and death. The sacrificial death of Jesus is what atones for our sins. And forgiveness cannot be given without atonement being made. And each of us need God's forgiveness because we are all sinners. Not one of us match that. Every one of us need God's forgiveness and every one of us deserve God's judgment on sin. And unless something covers our sin and satisfies God's judgment and God, and, and, and then justice is not served on our sin and we are unforgivable at that moment. We still deserve judgment to be served on us without that. And in John, 1 John 1, 8, John, the disciple of Jesus, tells you and I how good this good news is for not just you, but the world. And this is what he says. He, he says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful, and look at that, and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you that you will not sin. In other words, he goes, see, when you understand this and you truly get this, this will keep you far from wanting to wrong God because you know how beautiful this payment is for you. He goes, I write this to you so you won't sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. Maybe you've never read that verse two. Maybe you need to underline that. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for your sins. He's the atoning sacrifice for my sins, and he is the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. The whole world. He's not just good enough for my sins. He's good enough for your sin against me. But Casey, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know how they hurt me. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know all that I've suffered. And you're right, I don't. So Casey, you're telling me that Jesus' work on the cross is justice for the sins of those who have sinned against me. And the answer to that is yes, if they put their faith in, in Christ. You see where this gets real? real fast and for some of us maybe it's not you, you, you're not struggling with that maybe there's something you've done in your past and you say God that's, I, I feel like I still owe you something I gotta make it up somehow because I know how bad I've made them suffer I need to suffer more you don't feel like Jesus life suffering and death is justice enough for your sin against God. And this is why it's hard for you to receive God's forgiveness on your sin because your measure of justice you feel is more righteous than God's measure of justice on sin. And we say we are not gonna forgive ourselves, but you know what we're saying? We don't trust God's measure of justice on my sin. It's not good enough. And we become the righteous judge. When we say that God's measure of justice on my sin is not good enough, 
for my sin to be covered. And we become judged when we say that God's measure of justice on their sin against me is not good enough for that sin to be covered. Now here's something we got to understand about the good news. See, we are not just saved from God's judgment on sin. We are saved by God's judgment on sin. Yes, we are saved from God's judgment on sin, but we're not just only saved from God's judgment on sin. Did you recognize that you are saved by God fully serving the measure of justice on your sin against God, all your sins against God, and all the sins of those who will ever sin against you and against all other humanity? That is the measure of justice that is righteous. And the good news is that Jesus Christ's suffering and death is how God judged all people. See, forgiveness is granted to all humanity at the cost of Jesus Christ's death. God judged all sin and simultaneously demonstrated his love through the death of Jesus Christ. And this is why this is so important for you and this is so important for me because every sin I've ever committed and every ever will commit, every sin you have ever committed and will ever commit, every time you've hurt someone, every time you will hurt someone, every time I've hurt someone and in the future, every time I will hurt someone, Jesus Christ's suffering and death serves the justice was served in that judgment on Jesus on my behalf. Every one of my sins and yours. Jesus' death satisfies God's justice and the payment for all my sins, your sins, and even our enemies' sins. See, the good news is that Jesus satisfies God's wrath for all sin. And Paul tells us this is the good news. He tells us to the church in Rome, and this is what he says. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious, conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew or Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And look at this, all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance or his patience, He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. So as to be the just, as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. See, Jesus Christ's death is the benevolent payment to justify God's wrath on all sin. The question is, do we trust that? Do we trust that Jesus' death, his suffering and death is enough for my sin against God, your sin against God? Do you trust that? See, God will bring, he will serve justice on every sin. God will demonstrate his judgment on sin. He will judge every person's sin and bring justice for all sin. The question is, will you allow Jesus to be your payment for sin? Will you trust that what Jesus did through his suffering, his death, and through the resurrection that proves every word he says is true, will you trust that is good enough for all your sins and all the sins of those who are committed against you? Or will you trust? Do you think you don't trust that? You're not gonna accept that, you're gonna receive that. Because those who do not receive that, 
and who reject Jesus, do not accept him as Savior and follow him as Lord, God then will allow, because they rejected Christ, all the just judgment that we all deserve to fall on them. And everyone who does not receive Christ as Savior, following him as Lord, does not receive his forgiveness, he will wipe away from this earth and wipe away for eternity because he gives them what they want. They don't want him. They want to be God. They want to be in control of their own destiny. This is where the good news of Jesus is powerful for all of us. See, forgiveness is at the heart of the gospel of Jesus. Forgiveness is at the core of Christianity. Forgiveness is what sets us apart from any other religion. And it's not a religion. This is a relationship that God so amazingly wants with each and every one of us. And we must understand God's justice. We must understand it because it is the good news for each of us. It's the good news for our neighbor. It's the good news for our enemy. It's the good news for the world. And trust, and this is the series big idea that we're gonna be looking at. See, trusting in God's measure of justice on all sin gives us the grace and the freedom to forgive others. See, we forgive because we want them to experience the same grace we freely have been given. But the question is, whose measure of justice are you going to trust? Are you gonna trust your measure of justice? Or are you going to trust that Jesus Christ's suffering and his death is the measure of justice that satisfies God's requirement to extend forgiveness? What will you trust? Two questions I wanna ask you as we just go into this time where we're gonna take communion. Do you trust that Christ's death is good enough to atone for your sins against God. You know, there's nothing you do and no sin that you commit that God cannot forgive because of Christ's work on the cross. There's no sin that you commit and or ever will commit that God cannot forgive. The resurrection of Jesus is proof of that. And the second question I wanna ask, do you trust that Jesus Christ's death is good enough to atone for all who have sinned against you because there's no sin committed against you that Jesus Christ's death on the cross is not good enough to bring justice on their sin and it's what we freely receive that gives us the freedom and the grace to grant forgiveness. On the night Jesus would go to the cross, the night he would do it, he would establish the Lord's Supper, what we t- take today. And in this, he would take the, the cup and he would say, this is the blood of the covenant, a new covenant, a new way of relating with God. And he says, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is what Jesus did to serve justice on all sin. Your sin, my sin, and the sins committed against us. So we all can be forgiven. This is what he did. And communion is a reminder of this. And today, I'm gonna invite you forward in a moment and we're gonna receive these. We're gonna ask, ask you to take these elements, come down on your left, return on your right and hold on to them as we sing. And then we're gonna direct you in giving and we're gonna take these together. But this is what I want you to pray as you come forward. Will you pray, Father, I trust in your measure of justice and all sin. Thank you for your grace and the freedom to forgive others. I want you to reflect on that today. And I want us to be grateful for his measure of justice 
that grants us forgiveness. So will you stand with me? Will you exit out your left, grab your elements, return on your right, hold on to them, and we'll take them in a moment.
It's on that night that he would suffer for all of us in the world. He said, this is my body, broken for you. I want to ask you these two questions before we take this. Do you trust that his body suffered enough to serve justice on all your sins? Do you trust that his body served justice enough for all the sins against you? If so, as an act of faith, may we, his redeemed people, take this together. This is the blood of the covenant, which is given for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do you trust that Jesus' death is the only payment that is needed to make you right with God? And do you trust that Jesus' death is all that is needed to give you the freedom to forgive others. If you believe that, will you share this moment? Father, we trust in your measure of justice on all sin. Forgive us because in our insecurities, In our pain, we've misunderstood and misappropriated your judgment and what that justice is and how meaningful it is to us and to the world. And we ask you right now, because we've freely been given your forgiveness through Christ, sacrificial, costly death, and his resurrection is alive in us. May that give us the power, the boldness, and the freedom, and the grace we need to forgive others. In Jesus' name. As we continue to sing, our ushers are going to come forward for those who are prepared to give. Will you come and let's sing one more song before we leave? Will you lead us?
Amen. Amen. This is God's measure of justice on all our sins. That's good news, isn't it? And this is his measure of justice on all sin. And that's good news. And it's challenging to live. And that's what we're gonna be talking about in this series. So I invite you to come back next week. Also, if you'd like to pray with anyone for any reason, we have our prayer partners available on the sides of the room. They would love to pray with you. May you walk in the freedom that God's given you through your forgiveness of sin. And may you be a people who point people to the light of his good news by forgiving others of their sins. God bless you, Westside. We'll see you next Sunday.